What is going on, guys? As always, happy Wednesday. Uh, I have Cruz on the line with audio today, and we wanted to dig into kind of nutrient control, nutrient levels, and how it affects it, and kind of how to beat cyano and di dinoflagellates. How are you doing today, Cruz? Doing fine, Dev. How are you doing? It's been a while. Excellent. Thank you. It's definitely been a while since you've been on. Um, always appreciate you coming on. You're an awesome guest. So welcome. Thank you. Well, tons of people. You're an awesome host. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> tons of people in the chat. We've got Click Clacks, Chi Town Reefer, Fishy Snowman, McCullum's Reef, Corey Page. Hey, guys. Hopefully, Gabe's Reef Tampa. Hopefully, everyone's doing excellent today. Blinky Fish, Reaping the Band. Welcome, welcome. So, there seems to be Ryan Gill. Welcome, welcome. Uh, Greg Carroll. What's going on, guys? So, um,. Dinoflagellates is one thing that a lot of people seem to have issues with, and it tends to be one of those ones that is harder to beat for a good chunk of people. So I figure it'd be excellent one to do it. Uh, last week I did post kind of a method which came from Cruz about how to beat it, how to deal with it, and that's posted to the Facebook group. We'll talk about it today. Um, you guys can always reference that back later. There's a link in the description to that one. Um, so yeah, today, I guess one of the first ones to start talking about is nutrients in the reef tank. So one of the bigger theories is around, you know, a lack of there of nutrients causes dino in your tank. So back in the day, we used to have, you know, everyone was like, oh, trying to get nutrients down. Now it seems like with the advances in filtration and everything else that people are trying to get nutrients up, which is kind of funny how the tables have turned. But so... What do you think, Cruz, on the whole aspect of nutrient control and, you know, lack of nutrients causing dinoflagellates in a tank? Well, when a lot of people are registering, I want to say a lot of zeros, you know, like for their nitrates or phosphates. Um, what they also need to know is that sometimes, you know, like the HANA checker, mm -hmm. it's a different type of measuring device. It's more of a colorimeter. So you have a known wavelength LED that's at the bottom of the uh, of the test checker, and it doesn't necessarily mean that there's zero phosphates. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Whereas the old titration kits always show that there was some phosphates in mm -hmm. you know in the water column. So the method in which you measure your nitrates and your phosphates also plays a very very big role in whether or not you see any nutrients and yep. uh, you know nutrients in your water very true uh quick shout out jay lee 99 cent cheaper set thank you very much and mm -hmm. on the side of testing that is one thing mm -hmm. to keep in mind right because we are using hobby grade test kits and they're yep. not necessarily you know lab grade super high precision so there is that error so zero might not actually be zero it might just be low right mm -hmm. yep absolutely yep so now one thing that we were talking about before is, you know, one potential theory of where dino comes from could be from coral stress or something potentially expelling dino because corals do have dino flagellates or dino part of their algae cells to an extent. Correct. And uh, the zooxanthella are called um, dino flagellates being that they could move and migrate within the, you know, the coral tissue itself. Mm -hmm. And if you actually take a look at uh, I want to say amphidium, for instance, the cellular the cellular construction is very very similar to that of zooxanthella within the uh, the host coral. Mm -hmm. So that was one of the possibilities that you know that some people have brought up to me is they noticed that their corals bleach and then all of a sudden they had dinoflagellates on the sand. So it could potentially be a stress response of not having any nutrients to work with. I mean that's plausible potentially. Yeah. Yeah. So. You know, it's uh, that one I have not had a chance, and I'll be very, very honest. I haven't had a chance to really, really take a look at it, nor has, you know, I haven't seen any studies on, you know, diagnosing or comparing the two, mm -hmm. you know, whether or not they're similar, they're the same, or where they're, you know, where they're coming from. Yeah. Now, so now just to kind of talk about the one kind of method so we got the the crew special elegance coral method about how to beat down a flage and this also mm -hmm. kind of works for cyano um so the basic mm -hmm. mythology around it is that you're going to create an anaerobic environment above the capability so more so than the skimmer that's efficiently removing co2 so co dinos mm -hmm. as they grow they're going to eat suck up co2 or you're removing mm -hmm. their co2 source right so yep. And that's going to basically 
help prevent a bit of their photosynthesis. You're going to introduce a bacteria that's known to fight it, so kind of a controlled bacterial bloom of sorts, which is going to consume mm-hmm. the dinos, and it's also going to help absorb some of the nutrients from the dinos. Right? Correct. Okay. So, yep. So basically, you know, just to, just, just to sum it up very, very simply, creating that aerobic environment, mm-hmm. driving off the CO2, which is necessary in photosynthesis, dinoflagellates and cyanobacteria thrive off the lights, which is why a lot of people try the blackout method, trying to eliminate that light source for them. Mm-hmm. But instead of doing that, if you eliminate the CO2, it also affects their ability to photosynthesize without affecting your corals. Mm-hmm. Excellent. Uh, um, and then the second one is having a predator, a natural bacterial predator that could multiply faster than the dinoflagellates can. Mm-hmm. That could actually consume them, eat them, digest them, and turn them back into nutrients for your tank. Okay. You know, releasing it back into the water column. Mm-hmm. And then taking another strain of bacteria, the absorbent type, you know, it absorbs all the nutrients, a lot of the nitrates, bonds, binds the phosphates and then gets expelled by the skimmer and pulled out, uh, you know, utilizing protein fractionation. Yep. Okay. Um, quick show to so. Ravi. Thank you for the $1 super chat. Mm-hmm. Um, now with this, so we're essentially using bacteria to help fight off the dino flash, dino in your tank or cyano, either mm-hmm. one, right? Mm-hmm. So yep. cyano is a bacteria. It's not an algae. Um, and we also have dino, mm-hmm. which is a dino I mean, it's its own thing. But mm-hmm. it's m- more of an algae, I guess, than a bacteria. But it is a free-swimming, floating one. Mm-hmm. Uh, Andrew Newton. Hey, Cruz and Devin. Uh, hello, Andrew. Um, so let me just quickly pull up the secret method whenever I find it in my list here. <laughs> Excuse me. Yep. A lot of allergies out here. Ah, yes. No, I definitely... It's been getting me to this spring. Yep. So I apologize to everybody that's <laughs> listening to my coughing and my sneezing. <laughs> <laughs> fair trade, fair trade. Solving big problems here. Um, all right. So pull up the method. Okay. So dinoflagellate cyanoregime. regime. So the two main or the the main things you need. Uh, so an aqualifter pump. I do get asked mm-hmm. a lot. Does it have to be an aqualifter? Do you need an aqualifter? Um, you can still use a regular air pump, but the aqualifter has certain advantages, like it has an intake hose, so you could take that to somewhere like outside air and give it more of a you know lower CO2 environment to pull from. So having that little inlet on it is a big thing. Um, also, mm-hmm. I mean, you can use it for water and other stuff, which is kind of useful after the fact. Uh, the other mm-hmm. question I've had many times is, do you need a wooden air stone? Um, the reason for using the wooden air stone is that it creates finer bubbles. So we'll get back to that one. Um, airline, obviously. Mm-hmm. Um, so for a bacteria source, there is either ATM colony or compatible. So some kind of a good bacteria cycling source, as well as Dr. Tim's waste away. Acrobreeder, thank you for the $1 and one cent super chat. Much appreciated. Um, so basically, we need a bacteria source that's going to fight the dinos. And that mm-hmm. is the Dr. Tim's waste away, essentially. All right. Now we also need that is correct. something like ATM Colony or one of the Fritz or the Triple Starts or the one and only is basically a good bacteria source to help replenish the tank of the good stuff as well. Correct? Mm-hmm. That is correct. Okay. Uh, next on there. Uh, so ATM Colony. So number seven, we got 10 times activated filtered carbon. Um, that one I've had a few questions about as well. Um, basically, it just you want a filtered, more pure vodka you could probably use anyone but it just has less impurities and less things that will cause any issue in the tank correct and if you also want to drink with your tank you have something that's of high quality to also <laughs> drink can, with your tank you can oh. share a little for you a little for me <laughs> exactly so why not why not the good stuff no nope, exactly fish and wall 199 super chat you guys are amazing today thank you very much <laughs> um much much appreciated guys Okay, so we got the te- so we got the vodka. Mm-hmm. Um, we got three percent hydrogen peroxide. That's kind of the standard one you'd find at drugstores or dollar store wherever you get your stuff. And mm-hmm. the optional one is CO two absorbent media. So that's just to help boost your pH a little more. Um, don't have to have it, but if you have some, nice to have. All right, so mm-hmm. day zero. Okay, so aerate the whole yep. system. 
for a full 24 hours utilizing items two through five. So basically you're winning air stone with your aqua lifter. Um, uh, mm -hmm. be sure low CO2 air source. So that's why you can use a CO2 scrubber or you can use an outside air source. Um, so yep. that's kind of why the whole advantage of using the aqua lifter. Now mm -hmm. for just throwing this one in there, should you initially remove as much dinos or cyano as possible before you start this method? I, I know for me personally, I, I would want to leave them in there. Would you? Yeah. Okay. Me, I'd suck out everything first, just so there's less yeah, stuff to I fight. Mean, <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, uh, typically, uh, what a lot of people see is that um, the dinoflagellates are spread very, very thinly. Mm -hmm. You know, all up in the rock work, so on and so forth. The bubbling tends to irritate them a mm -hmm. little bit and tends to clump them up together. That's why day one, you would do the manual removal. Yeah. Okay. No, fair enough. Makes sense. Yeah, okay. okay. No, I see, I see your logic. I, I, I would do it first, but I see your logic. Okay. All right, mm -hmm. so day zero. So you do your first thing. Give it 24 hours. You're bubbling your tank. Um, we have done lots of videos on bubbling in the past. If you mm -hmm. have, if you haven't seen the bubbling, here, where is it? Where's my bubbling thing? Oop. Boom. So you can basically take bubbles. The idea with injecting the bubbles into your tank is one, it's gonna help drive out the CO2. Uh, the bubbles mm -hmm. also essentially turn your tank into like a giant protein skimmer. So those little bubbles will attach to those organics, those little dino cells, chunk little cells of cyano, and it's going to help lift it up out of the tank to mm -hmm. the water to overflow so you can kind of take it out through your mechanical filtration. Um, so that's one of the big things. Now, also when you're mm -hmm. dosing these peroxide. peroxide or these bacteria strains, anything to your tank, a yep. lot of, as they grow, you get a bacteria bloom, it's going to absorb CO2 into your water. Or sorry, they're going to consume oxygen in your water as they grow. And, mm -hmm. and pump in CO2. And pump in yep. CO2. So you're using this to kind of counteract that as you're essentially making a bacteria bloom happen to build up your army in the tank. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So we got that. Okay. So day one, aeration should remain on from day zero. So our tank's been aeration for 24 hours. Turn off the skimmer. Um, so yep. add one cap or three mils of your ATM colony or your bacteria source. And one mm -hmm. cap or three mils of Dr. Tim's away per 20 gallons. Okay. So we're taking that, we're adding our bacteria, our good bacteria army to the tank. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we turn off our skimmer because we don't want to take away the good bacteria that we're adding in. Right? Correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, then we're adding 2.5 mils of vodka per 15 gallons of total water volume. So adding vodka is carbon dosing the tank. Now carbon dosing is going to feed the bacteria. So you're using that to build up that bacteria army that's fighting the dinos in your tank. Mm-hmm. Yep. That's correct. And our tanks are, I want to say, naturally lower in carbon source to begin with. Mm -hmm. So okay. that's one of the reasons why when people think that they've done a cycle, that the good bacteria stay in there. Well, the population is so low after you stop, you know, once the uh, cycle is over, mm -hmm. the carbon source is utilized to maintain that healthy population. Okay. Now, Craig is asking, um, should you not go mm -hmm. slower with the vodka dose to try not create a large bacteria boom too quickly? Yeah, you can. You could mm -hmm. do it slow. You could take, uh, you know, anywhere to up to 180 days. But I know that a lot of people <laughs> do want to eradicate the dinoflagellates or at least knock back the dinoflagellate population as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. And okay. with the aeration and the addition of vodka, you don't have to worry about depletion of oxygen in your water because... Whenever you add, uh, I want to say, any type of solution, any type of food, if you have an apex, you could actually see the ORP drop. That's mm -hmm. basically the consumption of oxygen or the drive off of oxygen out of the water, out of solution. And that's one, one of the reasons why a lot of people are so scared to add vodka is because they don't have proper aeration going on mm -hmm. to actually offset that ORP drop. Okay. That makes sense. Does that, so... You, you could go slower, and that's mm -hmm. fine. Um, but, yeah, for, I want to say, the quickness of the reaction and how fast you actually want to build up this bacterial colony to get rid of, I want to call it the nuisance, mm -hmm. um, as soon as possible. That's one of the reasons why you would actually jump up the okay. bacterial colony as soon as possible. Gotcha. All right. And now to counteract the, the negative effects, that's why we're doing the bubbling and the aeration to the system. Correct. Okay, so we got day one, and then the last step, uh, manually siphon out 
any visible chunks of dinocyano mats or clumps in the tank. So we're going to remove whatever the bubbles have kind of conglomerated or whatever is easy to suck out to start with. Mm -hmm. All right. So day two, aeration on. We're still bubbling. Um, our skimmer's still off. Uh, mm -hmm. Add five mils of vodka per 15 gallons. So again, we're carbon dosing. We're feeding that good bacteria army. Um, mm -hmm. That and manly. Uh, where am I? Okay, day one. Uh, so add, add the bacteria. Yep. So add that, manually siphon out any large clumps, and stir 30% mm -hmm. of the sand bed if applicable. Mm -hmm. All right. Yep. That, uh, basically, the stirring of the sand bed allows the bacteria that's in the water column or, you know, that you've created this uh, bacterial bloom to be able to find and, you know, all the embedded or I'm going to call it nested dinoflagellates that are in the sand bed and mm -hmm. in, in or around the... Uh, the live rock. Okay. So typically a lot of people see a buildup around the base of the rocks or their mm -hmm. rock work. Okay. And you kind of want to mix it up so that they can't protect themselves. And it's kind of like, uh, uh, have you seen the movie 300 where the, uh, where the Spartans Spartan? kind of like cluster yeah. together? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> where the Spartans cluster together, they have their shields up. <laughs> well, that's basically what the dinoflagellates are like. Okay. They try to, the, they try to protect themselves by numbers. So mm -hmm. they layer themselves on top of each other, creating this very, very thick mat. So at least the ones on the bottom are not being attacked by the bacteria that you're just putting in, as well as they hate vodka, you know, at least the ethanol. Yep. Um, it, it, it's a reaction. We see it in Zoas uh, when we also dose uh, hydrogen peroxide. It's a, it's a, I want to call it a defensive mechanism that the dinoflagellates tend to want to congregate together so that they could protect their numbers. Okay. Now, just for one scrolls off. So Tom was asking, what about mm -hmm. vinegar to replace vodka? And then Greg was also saying, Randy Holmes finally suggests vinegar over our vodka because organisms like cyano can't utilize this its form of carbon. So any thoughts on carbon or vinegar versus vodka? And if there's a... Yeah. Uh, and and I, do have a, I, I do have a little bit of a preference for vodka, being that mm -hmm. vodka is sterile. Okay. It is very, very sterile. Uh, vinegar, I mean, you've seen vinegar eels, vinegar worms, um, you know, in bottles of vinegar that have been left for a long time. The organics never die. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So if you do have, like, say, I want to say a, um, a bottle that had been contaminated and you're not sure, you know, why it smells a little bit funny or it looks funny, it's got a little brown tinge to it, that's typically a bacterial colonization that does not need, you know, the oxygen and they're utilizing the vinegar already as a fuel source. Mm -hmm. So in order to get a pure carbon source, typically a lot of the people, especially the people that make no pox have chosen to utilize the ethanol, um, the ethanol base or an alcohol base because it can be sterile mm -hmm. and you don't have to worry about bacterial populations at that point or organic, uh, I want to call it, um, yeah, any, any, impurities okay that nope. uh that would normally grow does that okay. kind of make sense yep no nope. i see your logic on that one um someone else was asking about some uh is esv transition elements plus a good carbon source i'm assuming that's something similar to nopox which is probably an ethanol vinegar vodka style blend mm -hmm. uh, haven't used that one i haven't really tried that no mm -hmm. i haven't tried that i have tried nopox it's a more dilute form of the vodka um so you have to utilize a little mm. bit more per volume to get okay. the same uh, effects now going going on a butt of a limb like yes vodka mm -hmm. other sources you need to add more than you would for the same concentration of vinegar or sorry mm -hmm. uh you'd have to add more vinegar in the same concentration of the vodka so i'm gonna i'm gonna just blindly say like there's a good chance it's still gonna work it's still a carbon source you're still feeding Correct. the bacteria so mm -hmm. you could likely substitute it i mean there is charts online to kind of say the ratios of vodka to vinegar so I mean, you could probably use one of those and make a substitution. You're still going to get the benefits from it, right? Because you're still building the correct carbon source. It mm -hmm. might not be the yep. perfect, but it'll still do the job. Correct. Yeah. So, all right. Substitutions are allowed. <laughs> uh, to Absolutely. Okay. It has to be comparable, though. Mm -hmm. The concentration has to be comparable. And I know yeah. that a lot of people don't like to do chemistry and, you know, do the calculation for molality and molarity and all the other good stuff, you know, that nerds like to do. But... You know, mm -hmm. straight out of the bottle, get, you know, vodka is already pre-measured. Yep. Okay. It already has a, I'm going to 
uh, say an FDA regulated, you know, label saying what it is, what its percentage is, so on and so forth. And so does vinegar, you mm-hmm. know, as an adjustable too. The FDA okay. does have controls over that and quality control. Mm-hmm. Okay. So those two would be, I want to say, pretty comparable. Okay. No, that's fair. Um, so yeah, substitute away, but figure out your own ratios. <laughs> okay, so Correct. okay, day three, aeration system still on, so we're still bubbling, skimmers still off. Add another cap full of colony or your good bacteria cycling source, as well as another cap full of waste away per 20 gallons. Uh, another f- five mil of vodka per 15 gallons, manually siphon out. So if you got any more dino or cyano that is grown or you found some other clumps, suck those out. Um, stir the sound bed. So basically the yep. same. Work it out. Yep. Yep. All right. So you got a note here. If elk is above yep, 8.2. Absolutely. So what I did from... Uh... Do you tell? Do you tell? <laughs> okay, sorry about that. In the original one, I only had one day of dosing, which was a huge amount of carbon and a huge amount of bacteria. Mm-hmm. You know, the ratios were different. If you actually, if anybody seen the original one, it was a lot more aggressive and a lot less conservative than this methodology. So mm-hmm. what I did is I split up the bacterial dosing over three days as opposed to just one. I also spread out the carbon dosing over three or four days as opposed to just, you know, one or two days. Mm -hmm. Does that kind of make sense? So this methodology has evolved over time. People have, you know, notified me that, hey, you know what? This is moving a little bit too fast. I can't keep up or I have to go to work. I can't keep my eye on it. Mm -hmm. So I had to modify the regimen so that, you know, we're taking smaller steps and we have higher resolution into control Mm -hmm. over this methodology and this bacterial bloom. So even though 2.5 mils per 15 gallons seems like a lot, it's yep. a lot slower, you know, for a big system mm-hmm. than you would see for a small system. Okay. So when, so this methodology was built around, I want to say mid-sized tanks, you know, typically anywhere from, you know, I want to say 55 and up all the way up to about 300 gallons. Okay. If that makes sense. Okay. So it covers 80% of the people and 80% of the hobby. <laughs> Sounds good. Okay. Um, now you have a note here. So if the elk is 8.2 and pH starts dropping below 7.6, turn on the skimmer and dose 3 mil of peroxide mm-hmm. into the air intake tube of the skimmer. So not the sound strip, but the intake. Yep. So the purpose of this would be the peroxide <coughs> would basically tone down that mm-hmm. population of your army of bacteria. So just so you're not sucking too Correct. much oxygen out of the water and dropping your pH too low. Right. So that's yep, kind of that why that's there. absolutely correct. So I inserted exactly. I inserted that caveat because I did not have that before. Mm-hmm. You know, once again, it goes back to I can't keep up. I'm not used to driving at 210 miles per hour. I'm used to driving at 80. Mm-hmm. So in my perspective at that point is how do I make it a more controlled bacterial bloom that is, I want to say, more easy to tune, more easy to adapt to, and um, a lot less aggressive than, you know, than the original regimen. Okay. Excellent. So it goes at the speed of reefing. (laughs) (laughs) Fair enough. Um, Okay, there we go. So so day four. So we're still bubbling, skimmer to be turned on. So day four, we turn our skimmer back on. Um, Mm -hmm. So add two and a half mils of vodka. So we've cut our vodka per 15 gallons. We've cut our food source for the good bacteria down uh manly siphon out any clumps again uh stir the sand bed 30 percent ish if applicable uh slowly dose half a mil of peroxide per 25 gallons total system volume to the air intake of the skimmer so at this point we're starting to tone down the army of bacteria a bit yep the one that's actually in the water column which is typically um the absorbing bacteria so this is the waste of, uh, sorry, not the waste away, though. This is the one and only, this is the ATM colony. This is the, you know, the Dr. Tim's one. Uh, yeah, I already mentioned that Dr. Tim's one and only, the Fritz. Um, you know, all those comparable types of bacteria. They're the ones that mm-hmm. absorb the nutrients out of the water, takes the nitrates, finds the phosphates, and then gets skimmed out. Okay. So that's what we're trying to do is we're trying to thin down, uh, thin down that population. Okay, so we build up a massive army. We let it do its job, and then we're mm-hmm. starting to tone down the army now. Yep. Kevin, 
Thank you. Five dollar super chat. Hit those thumbs up. They are free here. Yes, they are. All the thumbs up you can handle. Always appreciated. <laughs> you guys enjoying it? You're learning something. Appreciate crews on. Hit those thumbs up. Um. Okay. So day five. Do 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 do. Kevin, thank you, sir. Much appreciated, buddy. All right. So day five. We got air dies. Do day five. No. Okay. So day five. So aeration on. Skimmers on. We're at a cap full of each of the bacterias again per twenty gallons. Or we're adding more of our mm -hmm. bacteria. Or so we're taking some down, but we're still adding a bit of fresh meat, for lack of a better term, to the system. Add <laughs> absolutely fresh yeah. soldiers. Yeah, fresh soldiers, fresh yeah. army. Um, add 1.5. So I'd add another cap full of each per 20 gallons. Add 1.5 mil. So our vodka dose is yet cut down again. So we're giving them less of a food source. Mm -hmm. We're down to 1.5 mils per 15 gallons. Siphon out any mm -hmm. visible clumps again. Stir sand bed 30% applicable. And step seven, slowly dose two mils of hydrogen peroxide per 25 gallons. So again, that's just going to knock down any of the excess of army. Mm hmm um so all right so got that day six aeration's on skimmer's on right, that's day seven or no yep. my, um day six hopefully i'm not saying it twice okay sorry okay all good um i struck my screen come back okay so we got that so skimmer's on that's on add one and a half mils of vodka per 15 gallons so we went from two and a half mil or so, so two days at one and a half mils man is life on anything stir sand bed now this time we're do dosing yeah. one mil of peroxide per 25 gallons. Okay, and then yep. d day seven, aeration's on, skimmer's on, one mil of vodka per 25 gallons, your sand bed 30%, slowly dosed half a mil of peroxide per 25 gallons. And after that, continue to dose half a mil of 3% hydrogen peroxide per 25 mils into the air take of the skimmer um until the water is optically clear all right so now we're mm -hmm. doing that to get rid of any leftover remnants of the army now correct it, so is there a chance that after these seven days there could be some left in the system they'd need to retreat or continue longer or should it more or less yeah. be done by seven days well for the most part many people have seen the you know, basically the eradication of dinoflagellates at that point, yep. or at least a very, very controlled population. At that point, they could let their system rest um, for a couple of days before going on with round two. Okay. So if you do see any straggling bacteria, you, I mean, sorry, not bacteria, dinoflagellates. Oh, totally just cut out. Oh, there you go. You're Am I back. correct? Right. You told you just cut out. Yeah. Say that again. You know what? Yep. Yeah. Okay. So while the enemy, yep. So while the enemy is at its lowest numbers, you want to repeat the process as soon as possible before it gets a foothold again. Mm -hmm. So that's where round two, round three. I've seen some people run the regiment at least, uh, at, sorry, at most three times back to back. Yep. With uh, minimal impact to their tank. Okay. Their fish are still good. Their corals were still good. Mm -hmm. um, you know. So. During this whole process, the you know you don't have to change your lighting regimen. You don't have to change the way that you're reefing. You do want to cut back a little bit on the feeding okay. at this time too. Um, but if you start seeing your fish, uh, you know during this time start getting a little bit listless, or you start noticing that they're picking on rocks, they are still grazing. They're not they're not truly hungry. They are picking at the rock and they're doing their job in grazing at the you know there's they see something. Yeah. <laughs> you know on the rocks mm -hmm. so that they could actually eat it and most people see that as oh it's a hunger response no not really in nature they they like to graze yeah. constantly no definitely all day um, grazers yep so with tings they typically graze you know for the majority of the day and it's i want to call it a natural behavior just like the sand sifting gobies they typically don't eat mices you know straight from a cube mm -hmm. <laughs> i don't see how that's I don't see how that's natural, yep. but yet they say it is. Um, so it, it, th there's a very, very fine line between what was natural in the hobby and what's natural in nature. Mm -hmm. Have you seen that? Uh, I want to say, have you seen that argument before? <laughs> yes, many times, <laughs> many like, times. They're like, oh, well, that's normal in the hobby. But you're mm -hmm. like, but they don't do that in nature. Yeah. And I've, I've been scuba diving a lot and. Um, you know, there's a lot of people that I do, you know, that are in the reefing hobby that do, you know, that go scuba diving and we watch the, we watch the fish, we watch the little invertebrates do their thing. Mm -hmm. 
And it's really, really kind of interesting that they don't act the same. Yeah. Um, that the way that they act in, in a glass box. And it's true. I mean, we are trying to mimic nature, but again, I mean, we have a very small piece of nature, so we, we can only get it so close. So, mm -hmm. correct, correct. Certain but things. if you are, yeah, if you see them acting naturally, picking at rocks, picking at the sand, mm -hmm. they see something, and they and they haven't lost significant amount of weight, then they're doing something and they're grazing correctly. You know, they're still healthy. You don't see their skeleton. They're not transparent. Mm -hmm. You know, at that point, you kind of you kind of ask yourself, "Well, I haven't fed them in a while, but yet they're still fat." <laughs> yep. You know, and they're healthy looking, and you know, there's no disease, there's no ick. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, even after the treatment, I still suggest you know to continue the bubbling at night to maintain the pH. Yeah. You know, at a higher level according to your alkalinity. Mm -hmm. See, what a lot of people forget is the whole phrase of don't chase your pH, they forgot the last part of that phrase, which is don't chase pH with alkalinity or buffers yes, or any other buffer supplements. Buffers are trouble. Avoid them. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. But trying to normalize your pH to your yeah. alkalinity, utilizing oxygen and driving off the CO2, mm -hmm. what, what is wrong with that? No, with you. You know, you're creating it, you know, you're creating an aerobic environment in nature, you see waves crashing on the beach, waves cresting over the coral, you know, the coral reefs, causing all these minute particles, you know, bubble particles, um, you know, nano, micro, whatever you want to call them, mm -hmm. in the surf zone. So, I mean, bubbles have always been part of nature. Oh, you know, they they're, <laughs> they're used to protein skim, and you see this foam on the beach, you know, after a nice heavy storm. Um, you know, and the waves are crashing continuously. That's your skimmer in nature. Yep. Mother well, nature's skimmer. <laughs> well, so um, I was joking about it, the girl at the Ripley's Aquarium when I did the thing with her. But, you know, when you go to the beach and kids are all playing with the foam, you're like, yep, you're playing with Mother Nature's skimming. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. All the fish poop and everything else that's in the water, including bacteria. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> and it's fun. Yep. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's, uh, Just don't you know, it. bubbles happen in nature. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, I know that once upon a time, there was a lot of things that reefers were scared about. And it seems like some of those beliefs have carried over, you know, over time, mm -hmm. you know, such as vodka dosing. And the thing was, is that yes, it causes a bacterial boom. But if you understand what the bacteria is doing, the aerobic ones, where they're sucking up the oxygen and taking it away from your corals and your fish, mm -hmm. and you know how to solve for that and resolve that issue by additional uh you know additional aeration so on and so forth mm -hmm. or a more efficient way to increase the aeration yeah why 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 don't you you know what i'm saying there's nothing harmful about that mm -hmm. to be able to offset you know one effect to another well that's a good thing that a lot of people I don't think consider if they're dosing you know like waste away or sludge removers all mm -hmm. the stuff into your tank is you know keep an eye on your if you have a ph probe you know a good chunk of the time you're going to see a dip or a drop when you're dosing stuff in your tank because they are a mm -hmm. bacterial type of product and as they mm -hmm. grow and do their thing they're like anything else in your tank they're absorbing the oxygen which is and releasing co2 which drives on your ph correct because uh you know people think of bacteria as this really teeny tiny speck just one but when you take a look at the enormous number you know hundreds the of thousands of, of bacteria, specs <laughs> it's it, it, it's an organism, mm -hmm. you know, it in itself is a body organism, you know, that's composed of multi cells of single bacteria. Yeah. Does that make sense? Well, that's <laughs> what a coral is. Cellular animals. Think, think of a coral. Each Absolutely. polyp is its own animal and they, they're basically a big colony of animals to make a coral. So a similar idea, right? On a Correct. bigger scale, even though coral is still tiny. Absolutely. And uh, you hit the nail on the head on that one. Mm-hmm. <laughs> strength in numbers buddy exactly and bacteria yep. is so much more smaller and mm -hmm. yep and dinoflagellates are also small yep and the, one of the reasons why we utilize the waste away is because it is a macrophage bacteria it's it's very very similar to i want to call it an amoeba type where it Quick surrounds question. its uh what, what does yeah, macrophage mean what is macrophage oh macrophage means big mouth okay thank you Okay, sorry, carry on. So it surrounds something or other? <laughs> it's, yeah. it's, it surrounds uh, whatever the heck it's trying to eat, 
whether or not it's uh, an undigested piece of food, a food particulate, detritus, mm -hmm. and even dinoflagellates or the dying ones because you have, you have uh, taken away its CO2. It's now starting to weaken. Mm -hmm. Well, now the bacteria is opportunistic, and at that point, it will attack the dinoflagellates on the sand. Mm -hmm. And also the ones that are in the water column. That's one of the reasons why we're forcing or inducing a bacterial bloom that's very, very controlled. Yeah. So it's basically... And the, and, the, and the zooxanthella within the coral will be unharmed because the coral tissue is protecting it. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to worry about your coral too much. Okay. And, and <laughs> driving off the CO2 from the water environment doesn't affect the zooxanthella inside the corals either because mm -hmm. the corals pass the CO2 directly into the interstitial space mm -hmm. between the coral tissue and the coral skeleton protect you know creating that co2 rich zone for the zooxanthella that lives within it mm -hmm. so it's getting a direct source of co2 not from the water column but directly from the coral itself which is an animal yeah nice so yeah. they're more or less protected because of their kind of skin layer so essentially mm -hmm. as long as long as it's not a prolonged drop in co2 and ph everything the corals have that buffer it's not necessarily going to affect it for the short term treatment of a correct thing okay correct and that's one of the reasons for let's go ahead and act as soon as possible as fast as possible mm -hmm. to knock back the population um and i think that kind of answers you know why why are we doing this in a rapid succession mm -hmm. is because there's in my mind there's still a time limit yeah for the corals to be able to withstand the environmental change mm -hmm. i don't like to let them stress out for too long Okay. Does that make sense? Yep. And the fish too. I, I would still like to go back to feeding fish, you know, the mices and oh. you know, the rods, foods, okay, wait, et cetera. Wait. Now you're talking about feeding fish. Do you not feed during this treatment? We feed them very, very lean. Okay. So you're just a bit very skimpier lean. on the feeding during the treatment of the... Correct. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you you sell fish commission? Uh, one more question. I got a 60 liter aquarium with a bit of dinos on the rock and glass. Nothing on the sand, though. Is there a risk of it to move to the sand? Move to the sand there's to always, another system? There's always a potential. Mm -hmm. The dinoflagellates yeah. are modal, meaning that they could move from one place to another, depending mm -hmm. on the conditions. They always try to find the, I want to say, the optimum or the optimal environment for themselves for replication, et cetera, et cetera, finding nutrients, finding you know, the, the right amount of CO2. And a lot of the times the detritus that's in the sand bed have bacteria that, hmm. you know, are more or less anaerobic that will produce, or sorry, that are anaerobic near mm -hmm. the top, eating it and creating a zone of CO2. Okay, nice. So they will try to go over there, take over that little population, you mm -hmm. know, consume the CO2, consume the rest of the, you know, the nutrients that are pre-digested by the bacteria. Mm-hmm and then take it up for themselves so that it doesn't have to work so hard to extract the nutrients out of the water. Nice. Excellent. Okay. Comment from Kevin. So every, yeah. Every, yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Sorry. I have to throw this one out there. Kevin, I followed this step-by-step. -step. It works great. Even knock the green hair algae back enough for it to come off the rocks easily. Awesome, Kev. Good to hear it. I love Thank all you. those little success stories. <laughs> yeah. And the, the thing is, like, I've read so many like looking at old forum posts and stuff like there's so many people that have like shut down a tank as the dinos and it's like it's something you can get past like i feel that we're you know advanced enough with reefing now that there's no reason to shut down a tank over a certain algae or something like we got methods to beat and get through cyano through dino you know bryopsis like there's something to get over all these hurdles now so with i mean a little bit of education you could get through these hurdles that could otherwise make someone leave the hobby so i think that's awesome mm -hmm. which is really cool Absolutely. Yep. There's uh there was another uh, instance, and it was just very very recently. Mm -hmm. There was a person that I've been helping out, and they've been experiencing, I want to call it low nutrients, mm -hmm. and they're trying to fight off the diet. And the thing is, is that they're constantly dosing the nitrates, the phosphates, you know, the additives back into their water. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> you know, once again, how do you compete? against the dinoflagellates and how do you get the bacteria to replicate with very, you know, very, very low nutrients. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. And one of the things is that we artificially induce, you know, the bacterial bloom. Then we continue to feed the system. And then on days, you know, four, five, six, we don't even collect the skimmate. Yeah. Even though we're even though we're dosing the hydrogen peroxide to knock back the population, we're trying not to export the nutrients into a cup. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to pump back the nutrients back in so that the system can stabilize and establish that normalized, uh, I want to say nitrates and phosphate base. Yeah. Now, okay, here, here's an interesting question. In terms yeah. of not running out of nutrients, do you think it's better mm -hmm. to feed and put, put in more nutrients or just take out less? Take out less. Yeah. Okay. Because that's more controllable. Because once again, in this reefing hobby, it's easier to underdose than it is to deal with something when you overdose. Mm -hmm. For instance, alkalinity, that's a great one. Mm -hmm. If you overdose alkalinity, what is your, you know, what is, uh, what is, I want to say, what is your reaction to bring down that alkalinity? Let nature do its thing and get absorbed or do some water changes. <laughs> exactly. So the water changes is a lot faster, right? Mm -hmm. And everybody wants faster in this hobby yep. for some odd reason. So if you're at, you know, say 11 DKH and you're trying to bring it back down to normal. And in my case, what I would consider normal is anywhere from 8.4 to about 9.4, 9.5 mm -hmm. at the highest. Yeah. And in order for it to drop from 11 all the way down, if your magnesium is super high too, is it's going to take a long time because at that high of a pH and at that high of a DKH, corals don't want to uptake especially if you're you know especially if your nutrients are very very low one of them being phosphates if phosphates are very very low there's no uptake of the alkalinity mm -hmm. and that's one of the things that we also notice too yep is that if nitrates are super high phosphates are zero because you ran gfo mm -hmm. nitrates will not come down until you bump up the uh the po4 that's the phosphates that's a big mistake yeah, i see ahead. with people carbon dosing a lot so if they don't you need phosphates in order for the carbon dosing to work and get rid of nitrates so if you Correct. too much media it could you know be inhibiting your carbon dosing or whatever you're doing to get rid of those reduce yeah correct, correct. Uh, so that that's one uh i want to say misinformation is that Oh well, we need another type of bacteria to bring down the nitrates by itself. Mm -hmm. it, it it just overcomplicates the you know what Mother Nature already has provided for us. Yep. Uh, fish and wall. I owe my reef happiness to Cruz and this system. There you go, Cruz. <laughs> oh, I know, right? You know, I'm you, you know I'm blushing, right? <laughs> <laughs> You're not on camera, but I believe you. <laughs> um, uh, Nappy reefing. Anyone with a dino only specific. specific specific tank um dino only specific tank i don't know why i'd have a tank with only dino there is a luminescent dino that'd be kind of cool i have seen those completely random side topic but uh, yes and usually the tank is about like what 0.4 liters yeah <laughs> um Gla yeah. glass dinosaur yeah those little sealed ones um now there's a couple yeah. other people are talking about sinos come in different colors not always red at least when i bought yeah. it in the past i always had the green stuff i've never really had the red stuff for whatever reason but yeah, it could definitely mm -hmm. be green or red. Um, yep. A few people also are talking about ChemiClean. I've used that a couple times in the past. <laughs> it definitely works. Um, this yep. method can work for, you know, dinos and cyano, kind of double hit, depending on what you're fighting. Yep. But both work. And and uh, just a caveat and a touchback on uh, the cyanobacteria. It is known as a blue-green algae. Hmm. Good point. But I haven't seen blue. Yeah, me neither. I've only <laughs> seen green and red. So I don't know where the blue came from. That's yeah, that's green the new and one. red, typically. Yep, exactly. Um, maybe, maybe it's a maybe it's a dye that uh, that they were utilizing underneath the microscope so that you can see the structures. Mm-hmm. Uh, Greg, a couple of different people are talking about elk. He used to run elk as high as thirteen in the early two thousand. Ooh, that's up there. Um, Tristan SG, one dollar super chat. Thank you, Tristan. Appreciate it. Um, oh, I've never had an elk that high. I've had it as low as about five and a half, six, and I've had it up to maybe like eleven and a half. I don't think I've ever run as high as thirteen. Yep, I I've never run thirteen. Yep. Um, I've seen. Oh, yep. sorry. Uh, Corey was asking, can you still run bile pellets while doing this treatment or method? We take it offline because the bacteria tends to, I want to say, over 
overreact because of the additional carbon dosing. Okay. So what's going to end up happening is that your bio pellets start fouling up and get clogged up with the extra uh, bacteria that you just, you know, induced the bloom on. Mm -hmm. So we take it offline, we clean it, we repurpose it and get it back online after the treatment. Okay. Perfect. Um, someone's asking, is it hard to get rid of cyano? Not really. Um, you could use the method we talked about, or you could use ChemiClean. I would generally suck it out and then do a mm -hmm. treatment. Um, yep. And and uh, also, just to touch base on uh, on ChemiClean, too, if you notice in the instruction, it says aerate well. Yeah. And uh, once again, that's where the microbubbling does come in, and mm -hmm. it comes in very, very handy. While your skimmer is offline because you don't want it to, I want to say, overreact at that point, yep. utilize another means of aeration into your tank. What I always do as well is I'll take the cup mm -hmm. off of my skimmer and just let it overflow. Mm -hmm. um, yep. Now, it, good it, it does splatter and make little bazillion pops of bubbles and salt creep on the edges of your tank. So another trick, I've just used like a little plastic bowl upside down over top so it can still like mushroom mm -hmm. kind of go whoop and over into the tank. My whole sump <laughs> is like a jacuzzi. Um, no, that works well though. Mm -hmm. Like when I've done a chemi clean mm -hmm. and stuff in the past, take the cup off, put a little bowl or something over top of it at an angle so it still can overflow. And then do that. You can do mm -hmm. that with bubbling. You'll get tons of bubbles in your tank. So it's a good way to up Absolutely. your aeration during a treatment. Um, yeah. and, just and, and the thing is, is that, that this regimen does adapt to a lot of the other ones. The mm -hmm. thing is that I'm trying to uh, create a more standardized way to, to fight yep. uh, the dinoflagellates and also the cyano outbreaks. Um, it's very, very hard when everybody reefs differently mm -hmm. and the sumps are, are made differently and the overall system dynamics are different. So mm -hmm. I tried to, once again, it's not a hundred percent all the way across the board, but 80% is passing. No, exactly. I mean, does that makes sense. It does. And that is something you got to realize is, you know, every tank is different. Every tank will have different bacteria in it. It'll have different, you know, animals in it, different corals, mm -hmm. you know. And a lot of, well, honestly, most of it probably mm -hmm. comes down to the bacteria and what's living, how is the population, how are their numbers. Mm -hmm. So nothing's 100% from tank Correct. to tank. And that's what, but, Correct. And that's mm -hmm. one of the reasons why we induce that bacterial bloom and inoculate the tanks with this, you know, with a known strain of bacteria. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the reasons why I said, you know what, hey, utilize ATM colony or comparable utilize waste away or comparable at this moment there is no comparable for waste away yep um and that's you know what one of their i want to say dr tim's strengths yep you know and if you actually take a look at his regimen mm -hmm. it's very very similar to what we've developed too because i have talked to him on yep. a number of occasions mm -hmm. great guy nope. you know i was supposed to get him on a stream um, one day I, so i gotta do that <laughs> i talked to him about that a while a while back uh, oh absolutely <laughs> side note uh well, Brent Hill, yeah. if your skimmer is still foaming over after chemical clean treatment and water change, is another water change recommended and how soon after? Um, so you could e absolutely do another water change or you could just wait wait another day or two and it might work itself out. Um, one thing is generally I would just mm -hmm. open my skimmer open all the way so it's basically as high open as it can. It keeps your bubble really low and then you can slowly work it back up over a couple of days. That's another kind of method too. Forget your current yeah. settings. And, and to help yep. it out. Mm-hmm. Yep, and, and to help uh, of uh, aeration, just to yeah. make sure that nothing gets uh, suffocated by the release of, uh, I want to call it the oxidizer. Yeah. So the oxidizer will uh, deplete the uh, the oxygen out of the water. It utilizes that to, um, to digest, to get rid of certain things and break mm -hmm. up a lot of proteins. So be aware of that, that you also need a way to increase your oxygen intake yeah. back into your tank. Hey, excellent. Um, Cruz from this is Cruz from Elegance yep. Corals. He's been on randomly. It's been a while though. It's been a while since I've had you on. It's good to have you back, Cruz. Uh, Thanks, Steph. Yeah, it's always a pleasure. Likewise, uh, Acrobator always had little cyano and diatoms. I just live with it. I mean, if it's a very small amount, it's probably not a huge issue. If it's overtaking your tank, I mean, that's kind of the point when you want to do something about it. Yeah. Usually, if it starts to grow over Correct. top of corals or your sand bed, or it's starting to become unsightly, or a smothering something that's living well, in your tank, that's kind of the point. We're like, all right, maybe I should do something about it. Correct. Or if it starts killing your snails because they're consuming it. This is true. Okay. Yeah. D that's a good point. <laughs> uh, dino is toxic. So if fish or cleanup crew are eating it, it could potentially kill them or take them out. 
So yeah. that's another very good reason to do something about it if it becomes more than just a tiny little bit. So, Correct. So. And I'd rather deal with them sooner than later. It's mm-hmm. kind of like uh, protecting your house. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. It's always uh, good to take precautions as opposed to have to knee-jerk react and uh, always play a uh, firefighter okay. with your tank. Hey, I, okay, I got another good question. Let's cut out scroll by earlier. Yeah. What is your thoughts on flow preventing cyano? In, in my experience... I found it has made a difference because I've had it grow like right in front of a power head, not somewhere else. So I'm like, hmm. Mm-hmm. Do you th- do you think there's any correlation to that? Because I always hear increased flow. Yeah, well, see, flow doesn't necessarily mean increased oxygenation. Mm-hmm. Cyano does love lower oxygen, you know, oxygen levels. That's one of the reasons why you find them in the nooks and crannies, you know, where there's very very low flow or mm-hmm. deep inside a rock. Okay. or you know right at the base of the rock work because mm-hmm. that's where the slowest area of flow is but that's only provided that the oxygen levels in your system is good mm-hmm. does that make sense yep. if your oxygen and your levels are optimal and then you increase the flow it's very very rare that you would actually get that okay or that cyano would actually take over and one of the one of the key benefits of having micro bubbling you know, right before lights out is you could actually see the teeny tiny bubbles travel all the way across, you know, just watch, watch the bubble trail, Yeah. you know, watch how, how it circulates around your tank. That's one of the best part of bubbling is you could watch your flow. (laughs) Exactly. You could see the real flow, not your, not your supposed flow. Mm -hmm. And I know that a lot of people say, oh yeah, turbulence does everything. But if you take a look at your jacuzzi, there's always that spot in the corner or mm-hmm. right in the middle where the two flows crash together. Yep. That always has that mulm or that buildup of dirt, mm-hmm. you know, <laughs> there's always a spot. And, and I try to explain, yeah, I try to explain to people, I was like, now add rock work to it. Now you have what we call shadowing of that flow. Mm-hmm. And then the turbulence cancel a lot of each other out mm-hmm. in certain areas. Yep. So you don't get full turnover. And that's one of the reasons why we also do pulsed waves you know, uh, where we have a standing wave in the middle of the tank is the entire water column is constantly moving mm-hmm. as opposed to turbulence, which causes these dead spots or, you know, I mean, regardless of how fast you're moving, there's always going to be dead spots in turbulent flow. It's kind of like watching, uh, have you seen the harmonics where they put sand on top of a speaker and yeah. at certain frequencies? You get patterns and circles tends, and stuff. Yeah, mm-hmm. Cor- correct. And yeah. that's turbulence. That's mm-hmm. vibrational turbulence. And what ends up happening with liquid turbulence or what we call um, uh, fluid, you know, fluid turbulence is mm-hmm. that you get these settling areas always. I haven't seen one pattern that does not allow for settlement. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's where harmonics really, really comes into play. It's always is understanding why, why there's pulse, you know, why there's constant pulsing or cycles in nature itself. Mm-hmm. No, exactly. Okay. So, us- so, so when you, so, yeah, so when you take a real big step back mm-hmm. and take a look at the world and how it works, there's cycles everywhere. Yes. And just because you're done with the first cycle, you know, your nitrate cycle and all mm-hmm. that, when you're cycling your tank, does not mean that that's the only cycle that you need to worry about. Mm-hmm. Very, very it's true. Constantly cycling. Always tiny mini cycles from any disturbances or different things. Okay. Speaking of cycling. Uh, Mr. Enzacorium yep. was asking, can it help with initial <laughs> diatom bloom? Absolutely. The Think so? bacteria yep. such as, um, you know, one and only and ATM colony, mm-hmm. they, they outcompete the diatoms for the nutrients as well. Mm-hmm. And they multiply a lot faster than the diatoms. I've seen people utilize the diatom treatment for dinoflagellates, mm-hmm. but it takes them um, three, four, five months just to see any visible signs of improvement. Okay, so it can work, but take and a while. And at three, four, five months, I know a lot of people, Yeah, but I see people losing interest in their tank <laughs> after three weeks of fighting with dinos. Yeah. And they want to tear down their tank again. <laughs> yeah, that's no good. So, the whole, the whole so, point of all this is to prevent so, yeah. you wanting to tear down your tank, to make it successful and make you happy and enjoy and love the hobby. <laughs> 100 percent Okay, uh, Reefing with O was saying he killed dinos with UV. So UV, okay, the mm-hmm. U- UV will kill it. But you know, the one thing to consider is it will kill everything that flows here, right? It doesn't care. UV yep. doesn't discriminate. If you're flowing through it, it's taking you up, providing at the proper flow rate and contact time. But assuming yep. it's set up properly, yes, it, 
it will kill anything that flows through. So good and bad, it's going down. Now, and and this and, chucks and. up another one to the micro bubbling mm -hmm. is getting the dinoflagellates into the water column so that the UV can be effective. Mm. Good point. Good point. Um, so yes, UV does help. Yep. But once again, if you're going to be doing the quote unquote natural way, mm -hmm. um, you know, utilizing bacteria and reestablishing, you know, the correct bacterial population to continue that nutrient cycle and that nutrient export. Okay. Thanks. Do you really want to kill the bacteria that's doing all the work for you? Yep. Now, and that's the question. Speaking of bacteria strains, so Alex King was saying, I agree with the different strains. I've used Fritz 460 and C Chem Pristine, and it helped fight beat the di dino. So there's definitely a lot of products out there. Um, I don't, we, we were referring Waste Away because that's the one we know has proven to work. Um, mm -hmm. there, but yeah, there's definitely a lot out there. And, you know, at the end of the day, I mean, having multiple strains, knowing they're all going to help benefit, you know, add that to the army once in a while isn't going to hurt. Absolutely. Yeah. Biodiversity at the microfaunal, you mm -hmm. know, at that microbial level is always good. That's one thing that a lot of people forget is that bacteria is one of the base forms for stability in your reef tank. Mm -hmm. Hey, so bacteria, don't forget your bacteria. Bacteria basically rules the world. I mean, we eat something, our stomach digests it. It's bacteria doing all the work inside, right? Like there's bacteria, you know, look yep. at us, yogurt, pro probiotic thing. Bacteria rules the world, man. Like everything's bacteria. We don't think about it, but it's everywhere. It literally rules the world. Uh, mm -hmm. um, so Corey was asking, is there a recommendation of how many air stones based on tank size? I've never used more I, than one. I've utilized, yeah. Uh, typical, well, you have a 200, right? You have a 200 gallon tank? Yeah, the display is 160 plus whatever sump is minus rock. I don't know. I say 160, but <laughs> roughly. Okay. Okay. So... So for uh, for volume size, I would say one airstone up to about 225, okay. 225 gallons. And then when you have multiple returns on a long, longer tank, like say an eight foot tank, you could utilize up to two. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, but once again, you, you only want the very, very, very fine bubbles getting mm -hmm. into the display tank because you don't want the excessive, I want to call it excessive popping of the bubbles at the surface. You know, it gets on your lights, gets over, you know, a lot of your expensive yep. equipment as well. So the the little video in my background is probably overkill excessive on the bubbles. Generally with the bubbles, they're we call them <laughs> micro and nano bubbles. And they're literally the size of like a mm -hmm. like a pin prick. If you put a period on a piece of paper, like that little tip of the pen is like you want very small bubbles. Still bigger. Yeah. Right. So I mean it, it, it looks like um if anybody's run a humidifier during the wintertime or even in the in the desert trying to increase the humidity in their house, it's that type of a mist. Mm -hmm. it, it looks like a mist uh, when it actually goes into the uh, when it goes into the display tank and it does not rise to the surface very very fast yep um now it the, just gets pushed around by the water now mm -hmm. the whole idea of the micro bubble is the big ones flow up in your sump and the tiny ones get sucked into your return pump and the mm -hmm. small ones are more basically nutrient or buoyant yeah. nu neutrally buoyant Bo thank you um Correct. So they're not going to float to the surface right away. They're going to hang out in your tank and dwell and float around for a long time. That gives it a chance to, one, bring that outside air into your tank and let more water dissolve it. And the other part is it can attach to little things. And eventually, as it makes its way out, it can, you know, take it for a mm -hmm. bit of a ride through the flow. Um, yep. Somebody yeah. was... And I like to I, I like to compare the smaller size to more surface area as well for the gas exchange. Mm hmm you know, to be able to force out the CO2 and reinsert the O2 into the water column. Yeah, you get more if surface area, sense. more contact time with a super tiny bubble, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. So someone else was asking, whoever it was, sorry, I think it was your self fisherman. It was asking how fast does dino grow? I have no idea how you quantify that. It'd probably really depend on what's around <laughs> it and what its food source is and all that jazz. Yeah. It grows very fast. Yep. Bacteria grows 10 times exponentially <laughs> faster. Yep. Um, and 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 uh, and to answer that question, the bacteria is not light dependent, but dinos are. Mm -hmm. And so is cyano. And that's one of the reasons why during the blackout um, or also inducing the bacterial bloom also diffuses a lot of that light that the dinos need mm -hmm. to uh, photosynthesize. So once again, you're weakening them and you're depriving them of the direct light 
Okay. Um, someone else, this is a completely random question, but they're asking, what is the red coral behind me? So the one right behind my head there, that one is Red Diablo, I believe. It was kind of a mystery coral, but I'm pretty sure that's which one it is. Uh, yep. Yeah. Sorry, you can't see that one, Cruz. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm driving blind. That's good. Yep, no problem. <laughs> uh, is there anything else you want to touch on? We're over at it. Yeah, open forum right now. Open forum. If there's any other questions in the chat, yeah. let us know. Um, Alan was saying good old fashioned elbow grease, poly filter, and a fishnet got rid of dinos. So you manually removed the heck out of them. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Um, as as long as you don't have whatever's feeding them in the first place, I mean, you, the biggest thing is right. You can always remove something, but is you also got to make sure you remove whatever the source is causing them in the first place. So if that's taken care of, then manually removing will work. But if there's something that still has a source for it or whatever is feeding it, there's still that risk of it coming back, right? Because you remedied Absolutely. what's there, but not necessarily remedied the cause. So something yeah. to keep in mind. So, yeah, that's one of the reasons why we do a lot of the root cause uh, analysis. Mm -hmm. You know, what caused this to happen? What did you do differently? You know, what did you feed? You know, what coral did you add? What fish did you add? What, you know, what invertebrates did you add? Mm -hmm. And we lost you. There you go. You know, because others as well. And then once again, somebody brought it up. And then somebody once brought up, you know, saying, hey, but we noticed that the, the, the you know, dinoflagellates look exactly like the Zuzabella. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, once again, I haven't even dived that deep into that one. But yeah, yeah it, it kind of does look the same, you know, like, uh, like Amphidium. Mm -hmm. um, it, it just might be an external form. Does that make sense? Yep. It looks similar. Oh, Clay 5, I have serious dinos now. Well, you joined on the right day. Rewind the stream if you missed it and watch the beginning and go through that method. Um, just if anyone didn't catch it, I did post that graphic in the Facebook group last week, so it's in there. I will bump it to the top of the page so it's there if anyone wants to watch it. But And let's quickly do that now. I'll do that after. But anyway, so the graphic's in there. If anyone needs it, wants to reference it, you can go from there. Absolutely. Perfect. Uh, Cruz, Devin, thanks for sharing the power of bacteria. Many reefers underestimate its power. 100%. <laughs> don't, don't underestimate bacteria. It rule, it's basically rules the world. Okay. Completely random, but I watched, I think this was a TED Talk, and they were doing city mm -hmm. planning, and there was like five engineers for like a month to figure out like the best path to put the bus stops in the route for traffic. They had this the same model mocked up and they put like a piece of I don't know if it was like yeast or oatmeal or something on on where the bus stops were. And within I think it was like a day or a day and a half, the bacteria had the perfect route, the exact same thing the engineers did in like a month. So look at that. <laughs> there you go. Bacteria, Mother Nature knows best. Like it's I was like Phew. So you just spent, you know, thousands of dollars paying these guys and bacteria's like, do 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 do, here's my oatmeal, thank you. Here's the best path. Identical <laughs> to what the engineers did. So there you go. That's uh, that's that, that's kind of along the same lines. Mother Nature finds a way. Exactly. And typically, the the <laughs> lowest uh, the lowest energy cost for the highest ROI. Exactly. So yep. don't don't dope bacteria <laughs> and deliver. Uh, Amen. Exactly. All right. I think we pretty much wrap it up for today. We've been on for a good hour. If you guys enjoyed this, as always, make sure you guys hit the like button. Cruz, thank you so much for joining us today and on your drive home. I uh, appreciate your mm -hmm. time hanging out and sharing the the bacteria knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> um, everybody in the chat. My pleasure. Yep. Thank you, sir. My, always good to have you on. I'm going to I gotta rope you in to come on like once a month. This is good to have you. We'll find more <laughs> yeah, interesting well, good topics. You. Yep. So thank you. Um, yeah. Everyone in the chat, I mean, the guys that gave me the super chats, Tristan, Kevin, Finwall, Acker Reader, I appreciate you guys. Thank you very much. As always, uh, you mean, found Thank this you. helpful. Thank you. Smash the like button mm -hmm. or just click it nicely, you know, your choice. <laughs> um, and yeah, hopefully this helps. And if it saves, you know, a couple people from shutting down a tank and makes you guys successful, I mean, work here is done. So thank you, Cruz. And thanks Absolutely. everyone for hanging out today. And I will see you guys all next week. All right. Thank you, thanks, guys. guys.